All right, this time we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God, free will, and total depravity, which is the first part of TULIP. And so uh, we're going to try to cover those three topics, and then uh, this evening uh, we will continue with unconditional election and predestination. So we'll have time for more detail on the various parts of TULIP. All right. Uh, the sovereignty of God. God is the creator, the master, the ruler of the universe and everything and everyone in it. Okay, whether you like it or not, God's the boss. Okay, period. There's a whole lot of people in the world that don't like it. It doesn't matter. Okay, God is the boss. Um, there is no being whether angel, demon, or human, with any power in and of himself. All power is from God and subject to his control. Okay? That is what I believe is the definition of sovereignty. The Calvinist changes that somewhat, in fact, considerably. Um, John Gill, an Englishman, he was a Baptist, he was a Calvinist. There's quite a few Calvinistic Baptists in England. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was a Calvinist. The current pastor of Spurgeon's church is a Calvinist. He's a good man, but he's a Calvinist. Um, Spurgeon was not nearly as extreme in his Calvinism as some, but John Gill, who was one of Spurgeon's predecessors in Spurgeon's church uh, said this, whatever is done in time is according to God's decree in eternity. Whatever happens, and when they say whatever, they mean whatever. Okay? Whatever happens is according to God's decree in eternity. A fellow named Lorraine Bettner um, who is a very famous Calvinist theologian, says, Even the fall of Adam, and through him the fall of the race, was not by chance or accident, but was so ordained in the secret counsels of God. Now the phrase, the secret counsels of God, I think they use that whenever they can't find a verse for it. <laughs> okay, it's a secret. Uh, <laughs> If it's a secret, I wonder how they know it. Okay, but somehow or other they know things that God has kept secret from us. Uh, <laughs> um, Arthur Pink, who is, again, is a very famous Calvinist. He has written some books that, I mean, he's got a book on Genesis that's about that big. Okay, and it would have a lot of good stuff in it. Okay, some of these Calvinists have some good stuff if they can just stay away from Calvinism. Okay. Um, let me say this, okay, and I would have to go back to the last message. Why am I talking about this? Because it is a dangerous thing that is happening in the church in America today. And guess what, beloved? America is still providing the money for missions around this world. And if America starts sending out more and more and more Calvinists, to the mission field, or bringing preachers from other countries and educating them in Calvinist institutions, then Calvinism is just going to spread like wildfire throughout the world. And there's going to be very little soul winning done. And that's a terrible, terrible shame. Um, let me read some names that you may recognize. John MacArthur, John Piper, uh, R.C. Spruill, who just recently died. Um, James White, Albert Moeller, he's the president of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, which is considered the flagship Southern Baptist Seminary. Um, these men are Calvinists. They may be good men, okay? I'm not attacking their morals, their integrity, their financial upstandingness, or anything like that. I'm not trying to say there's any kind of scandal or anything attached to any of these men. But their doctrines are bad. 
Okay, their doctrines are bad. Every one of these men is a Calvinist. Some of them you can hear on the radio just about any day of the week, on television and so on. They have written multitude of books and so on. They are extremely influential men and they teach and preach Calvinism. Okay? Um, all right, we got to move here. Um, so Arthur Pink says, It was God's will that sin should enter the world, for nothing happens save as God has eternally decreed. He went on to say, Not only did his omniscient eye see Adam eating of the forbidden fruit, but he decreed beforehand that he should do so. God in eternity past, before there was a world, before Adam was created, God decreed that Adam would eat the forbidden fruit. Now, I want you to think about this. God commanded Adam not to eat of the fruit. Right? He said, you can eat them all, but that one over there, and you're not supposed to eat that one. Right? He commanded Adam not to eat the fruit. Adam disobeyed. And by disobeying, he performed God's will. You say, wait a minute, God's will was don't eat it. I mean, isn't that what it sounds like to you? If you just read Genesis, what do you come up with? God didn't want them to eat the fruit, right? Well, if, if that's what God said don't do, then His will must have been not to do it. Doesn't that make sense? Sounds to me like it makes sense. So, Adam fulfilled God's will by disobeying. And because of, his, because of doing His will, God's will, God placed Adam and Eve and all their descendants under the curse. Adam disobeyed, but by disobeying he did what God wanted him to do in the first place. And what God made him do. Because he sovereignly decreed that he would do it. But then he punished him. And you and me. Okay? And there's 7 billion people in the world, probably about 90% or 95% of whom are headed straight for hell because it's the will of God. And that's what they say is sovereignty. 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 and 12. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and Thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of Thee, and Thou reignest over all. And in Thine hand is power and might. And notice this next part. And in Thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. God is the sovereign, but He can give strength to others. Okay, he can give, he can, it's in his hand to make others great. All right, now we're going to get to that thought a little bit more in just a minute. God's will, according to the Calvinist, cannot be thwarted or resisted by anyone to any degree. God is therefore the cause of of everything that happens, including sin and evil. Okay, now think about your own life. You are confronted with a decision of some sort. Okay? Let me get particular. You gentlemen, you're at home, the TV's on. You've just been watching a football game or whatever, okay? You've been watching something, there's nothing wrong. It's over, the next show comes on, and it's got some things on it that you look at and you say, hmm, oh, that's not good. Okay? The way that woman is dressed and that kind of stuff, I probably shouldn't watch this. 
you've now got a decision to make. Okay? Do I change channels, turn it off, or do I sit here and watch? You've got a decision to make. Sometimes you make the right decision, and maybe sometimes some of you make the wrong decision. And you're sitting there doing something that you know God doesn't want you to do. The Holy Spirit who lives within you has said, you know, you ought to turn that off. You didn't hear a voice, but you know He told you. Right? If you disobey the leading of the Holy Spirit and what you know is the standards can in the Bible, according to the Calvinist, you're fulfilling God's will. Because everything that happens was preordained by God. Now, beloved, that is absolute nonsense. Okay, I mean, I hate to say it, but that is bunk. Okay, that's baloney. As we say down south, that's hogwash. Okay? My goodness. Didn't we just read His holiness, His glory, His majesty? I don't get it. I mean, it was, we were talking to, I was talking to Howard in between. And pick up the Bible. Open to Genesis chapter 1. And start reading. Read the whole thing. There's a few verses, a very few, but a few verses that are going to give you a little bit of trouble. But you won't find Calvinism anywhere in it. Okay? It's not there. Now, you can go to seminary and find Calvinism. You can pick up the wrong books and find Calvinism. You can turn on the radio and find Calvinism, but you can't find it in the Bible. Okay? Read it, and you won't be a Calvinist. All right. Um, okay, some problems with their idea of Calvinism. First of all, what I just said, the Bible doesn't say that. This nonsense about God foreordained everything and everything that happens was God's will. Okay? You can't blame your sin on God. I'm sorry. But you can't. It's your fault. And that's it. Okay? The Bible doesn't say it. Give me a chapter and verse that, that gives this definition of sovereignty, and you can't find it. God is absolutely holy and cannot cause men to sin. And I've got several verses. Let me just read one of them for time's sake. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay? Your sin is your doing and not God's. God cannot be tempted with evil. He cannot do wrong. Okay? Um, my son likes to use this thing, an evangelistic tool at public parks and things. Um, three things God cannot do. And there's three doors. And the first one, and everybody said, and you ask somebody, can God do everything? Well, of course He can. Well, no, there's some things God cannot do. Let's take a look. Open the first door. God cannot lie. Titus 1, 2. Okay? And they say, oh, there's a bunch of things God cannot do. He's got the power to do anything, but His nature will not allow Him to be unholy, to be dishonest. Okay? And, and a number of other things. He cannot go contrary to his own nature. All right, so God is absolutely holy. He cannot cause men to sin. Uh, another verse on that. Talking about Jesus, Hebrews 7.26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Our Savior is absolutely holy. Um, does man have a free will? Every commandment of God and every offer of blessing, favor, or salvation in the Bible. Okay, God, throughout the Bible, He's telling people, do this, don't do that. 
do this, don't do that. If you do this, I will do this for you. If you do that, I will do this for you. Okay, he's, he's offering blessings and he's commanding obedience. Every single one of those implies, I think it more than implies, but let's say implies that man has a real choice. And if you don't have a real choice, God is mocking us. Okay, one of these days I'm going to do something. I keep meaning to do it and I keep forgetting it. Um, let's say uh, those little, little girls that were out there in the, what are their names? Okay, the older one is Isabel. Let's say I had Isabel standing right here. And I took a piece of candy. And I said, is Isabel, this is yours if you can reach it. She can't reach it, can she? She doesn't have a chance of reaching it. Okay? Is that what God does to us? Huh? Does He make offers that there's no way we can do it? We can't even choose it, according to the Calvinist. God had to choose it for us in eternity past. You see? And if I did that to Isabel, what would you think of me? Mean, nasty, cruel, wouldn't you? But the Calvinist says God does that, and we're supposed to bow down and say He's holy and He's wonderful. And Well, guess what? God is holy. God is wonderful because the Calvinist is wrong. Okay? All right. Um, ah, does man have a free will? Uh, God's chastening and His judgment of sin demands that man has real choices to make or God is not just. If you're not really responsible for your sin because God made you do it. And remember Flip Wilson? Ernestine? The church of what's happening now? The devil made me do it. That was ludicrous. That was silly. That was stupid. But for men who go to seminary and spend their life in the ministry to say, God made you do it, that's horrible. And then he's going to send people to hell because of something he made them do? Is that justice? I don't think so. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 5 verse 4. Okay, this is the story of Peter and Ananias and Sapphira, remember? They had a piece of property. They sold it. They brought the money to the apostles. They lied saying this is the entire proceeds of the sale, and it wasn't really. They kept back some of it. Well, here's what Peter said. While it remained, this property, was it not thine own? I mean, wasn't it yours to do with however you wanted? It was yours, right? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? You had this piece of land. It was your decision as to whether you kept it or sold it. You decided to sell it, and now you've got money in your hand. And he says, isn't it in your own power? I mean, don't you have the right to decide? That's my money. I can do with it what I want. If I want to go out and buy me a new Porsche, they didn't have Porsches in the first century, but, you know, a brand new chariot <laughs> with a white horse. Okay? He could have done it. He didn't have to give that money. He had a free will. Okay? He had a free will. And he says, you know, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You haven't lied to men, but to God. Okay? That was, was the sin. It wasn't what he did with the money. The money was his. He could do whatever he wanted to with it. Okay? But he lied about it, and he died. God punished him for his sin, not because of what he did with the money. All right? Here's another verse, and this is, I think this is fantastic. Okay? How does a sovereign God, how can he be absolutely sovereign 
and yet allow us to make decisions that are contrary to His will. John chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. Jesus is before Pilate. Pilate is accusing him, and Jesus isn't answering his questions. Okay, you remember that. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? You're not going to answer me? You're not going to talk to me? I'm the judge, don't you know that? You've got to talk to the judge. Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, I get this, except it were given thee from above. Pilate had power to crucify Christ because God gave him the power. God didn't make the decision for Pilate, but he gave Pilate the authority to do what he wanted to do. Okay? And he does the same thing for other people here on the earth in varying degrees. He's given President Trump a whole lot more power than I've got. God gives power. See, all power comes from Him. But He has the right. Anybody here a boss? You got people working under you? Huh? Some of you? Okay. Do you delegate power or do you do everything yourself? I hope you delegate a few things, right? I hope you tell some other people, you do this and I'll do that. And, you know, I mean, you drive yourself crazy if you try to do it all yourself. Well, of course, God's not going to drive himself crazy, but he, he distributes his power to other people and he gives them the right to make decisions. And he has done that for every single person on the face of the earth. We all have the right to make up our own mind. Now, Pilate is sitting there on the judgment seat, and Jesus is in front of him. But what about the next time they meet? Who's going to be on the judgment seat then? It'll be Jesus. And who's going to be in front of him being judged? It will be Pilate. Okay? Man makes decisions, some good and some bad, but those bad decisions, you don't get away with a one of them. Okay? Because God is the judge. And in the end, whatever God wants is going to happen. Okay? Um, all right. The one who's, who sat there meek and lowly, taking it, from Pilate and the high priest and all those guys, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Okay? And someday they're going to realize that. They'll realize it. All right. So that is sovereignty and free will. Does, is God sovereign? Absolutely. Does man have a free will? Yes, he does. Because the sovereign of the universe decided to let us have a free will. That's one thing the Calvinists say God can't do. It isn't amazing. He can do anything but give us a free will. <laughs> he can even make a sin, which is totally against his nature, according to the Calvinist. Oh my goodness, that's, that's gross. I shouldn't say that. My mother's maiden name was gross. <laughs> She'd get on us all the time. Don't say that! <laughs> oh, gross. Don't say that! Anyway. It's gross to accuse God the way the Calvinists do. Now they think that they are bringing honor and glory to God with their position on sovereignty, but they're not. All right, total depravity or total inability. Man cannot believe total inability, which is the Calvinist idea of depravity, man cannot believe until God regenerates him and gives him the gift of faith. But the Bible does not say that faith is a gift from God. Okay, you've got Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 there. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And the Calvinist says, see, faith is the gift of God. 
Okay, now I don't consider myself a Greek expert. I took Greek in, in Bible college, and I have used Greek from time to time since then. Um, I had a guy staying in my home one time, and I said to him that faith is not the gift of God. And he said, sure it is. It says that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And I said, no, it doesn't. Okay, and here's something about Greek grammar. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Grace and faith are feminine, feminine gender. Okay, grace and faith are feminine gender. That and it are neuter. And the genders have to match. The pronouns have to match the word that is the antecedent for the pronoun. There's nothing here that's neuter. I mean, uh, no, no noun that is neuter. The pronouns are neuter. So what is it that is the gift of God? Well, the subject of the verse and the verse following, in fact, several verses there together, the subject is salvation. The subject is how to get to heaven. Remember Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gift of God, not faith. Every one of you sitting here, whether you're saved or lost, every one of you is exercising faith right now. You probably never even thought of it. You are trusting those chairs. We used to have some folding chairs at Dayspring Bible College that uh, were not real trustworthy. <laughs> we were in a class one time. We're recording, you know, on video, and there's this guy from Minnesota, Tom Bowden, and he's sitting there, and you hear this snap, and all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, Tom disappeared from the picture. <laughs> the chair wasn't trustworthy. He had faith in it, but his faith was misplaced. Okay? And you've got faith in those chairs. You're trusting them to keep you off the floor. And so far, so good. Okay? <laughs> faith is natural to people. We all have faith, and we put it in various things. You trust your car. I've had cars that I couldn't trust. I was praying on the way out to the parking lot, Lord, please let it start. Okay? Um, faith is not a gift. Faith is not a gift. Um, I gave you another verse there. Uh, I'm not going to read all of that. Uh, the last part of verse 3 uh, says, this is Romans 12, verse 3, According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay, but the subject in that passage is not salvation. The subject in that passage is spiritual gifts that he gives to believers, and he says that you exercise them in faith. Got nothing to do with salvation. Okay, many, many, many times Calvinists will use verses that are on a totally different subject. Okay, you just have to read the context, and you can figure it out, no problem. Um, Okay, regeneration, and we talked about this earlier, and other benefits of salvation always come after faith. Um, okay, Acts chapter 15, verse 7 and 8. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that for a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Remember, he went down to Cornelius' house and preached to Cornelius and his friends, and they got saved. Uh, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. While Peter was preaching the gospel, they believed it, and God gave them the Holy Spirit. Okay, right then and there. Regeneration is when we receive the Holy Spirit and we're born again. So they believed, and then they were regenerated. And that's always the way it is. 
I, I was talking to a Calvinist one time and I said, okay, so you're telling me that a man is saved before he believes. Well, no, that's not what I mean. I said, now, wait a minute. Isn't that what you're saying? And he refused to admit it. But if you're regenerated before faith, then you're born again. You're a child of God. You're on your way to heaven and you don't even believe in Jesus. That's nonsense. Okay? That's nonsense. You can't get to heaven without believing in Jesus. That's the only way anybody's ever going to make it. <sighs> okay. Um, how dead is dead? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. How dead is dead? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And the Calvinist will say, a dead man can't do anything. Okay? Therefore, you can't even believe. Okay, now that's logic based on a phony premise. Okay? Because physical death is not the same as spiritual death. Okay? When you die, your soul and spirit leave your body. Okay? And you may be laying there on the floor, in a coffin, on a hospital bed. Your body is empty. You are gone. You know, the real nut is gone. That's just the shell. The real nut is gone. <laughs> okay. Um, no, a body can't do anything because there's nobody home. Okay, the person that was in that body is now either in heaven or hell. Okay, and that body can't do a thing. But spiritual death is not the same thing. Spiritual death, you've got a spirit, but it has been separated from God. It doesn't enjoy fellowship with God. It's a, it has sinned, and it is separated from God. Can it still make decisions? Okay, don't put this up because of time. But think back. Okay, if you want to look this up later. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 to 15. Adam and Eve have just sinned. And lo and behold, they're standing there and it occurs to them for the first time, we don't have any clothes on. And they're ashamed. They weren't ashamed before. There was no reason to be ashamed before. There was no sin. There was nothing wrong. But now they're sinners. They're ashamed. So they make themselves aprons out of fig leaves to cover themselves up. Then God comes to the garden, and what do they do? They run and hide. Okay? And God speaks to them, and they say, Here we are, Lord. Why are you hiding? Well, you know, we did something we shouldn't have done and we're scared. Okay? They have a consciousness of their sin. They understand they're guilty. And now they're afraid of God. They used to walk and talk with Him and have a good time. Okay, so what does God do? He explains to them the curse. This is what's going to happen because you've done wrong. And then he gives them the first prediction of the coming Messiah, who is going to be their Savior. Okay? And from every indication in that passage, it seems to me they understood him. Okay? He's talking to them, and they're getting the message. But the Calvinist says that it's impossible to understand God, because you are dead in trespasses and sins. Romans 1, 17 to 20. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. He's talking about lost people. They understand the wrath of God. It's revealed to them. All right? Then, because that which may be known of God is manifest, where? In them. God puts the knowledge of God in 
the unbeliever. Every person that lives knows there's a God. Atheists have to be taught, just like Calvinists have to be taught. Okay, you don't get it naturally. Naturally, everybody knows there's a God. Um, for God hath showed it unto them. You know, they say that if, if no one has learned, then no one has taught. Well, if God has showed it to them, they must have got the idea. Okay? For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood. The Bible makes it clear that lost people can understand some things about God. Not everything, but some things about God. Even His eternal power and Godhead. They know He's a person. He's not a thing. He's not an it. It's not let the force be with you. Okay? He is a person with extreme intelligence and extreme power who made everything that we see. Okay? And lost people know that. So that they are without excuse. Okay? Um, another verse, Romans 2, 14 and 15, um, which talk about the conscience that He's given us. Look at verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Around the world, almost all culture groups have the same basic standards of right and wrong. I mean, they deviate in various ways, but you go anywhere, it's wrong to kill. Almost everywhere, it's wrong to commit adultery, and so on. Because God has put that, the knowledge of the law, in their hearts. Okay? There's a lot of things that people can understand about God. People will use Calvinists will use 1 Corinthians 2 that a man cannot receive the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the things of God. But in that passage, verse 10, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. There are things only a believer is going to understand, and a lost man is never going to get it because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. But these are the deep things of God, not the gospel, not the fact that lost people are sinners bound for hell and they need to trust Christ as their Savior. Anybody can understand that if they'll simply think. When He is come, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Who is the Spirit going to reprove? He's going to reprove the world. Okay? The world. That's everybody. Calvinists like to say it's not, but that means everybody. It doesn't mean the elect. It means everybody. Okay? He's going to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's going to enable them to understand the gospel. He's going to teach them some things, put some things in their hearts so that they realize they're sinners. You have to be righteous to go to heaven, and if you don't trust Christ, there's going to be a terrible judgment ahead of you. Okay? That is for every single person, and the Spirit of God does His work. Okay? He does His work. Lost people can and do understand the gospel. They have the power to decide whether or not they're going to believe it and put their trust in Christ. Some do, some don't. There's a lot of people that understand and say, that's not for me, forget it. Okay? I've, I've known a number of people that, I mean, I've known people could quote the gospel back and forward to you and say, but I don't believe it. Okay? So, you and I, there's, there's, there's obviously a couple of things here. To Christians, be loyal to the Bible. Okay, I want you to think about this. Everywhere in this country, there are 
Christian radio stations. You can get Christian programs on TV. Um, one of the things a pastor hates to hear, and I heard this not long ago, I was talking to somebody, and oh, I just love Joyce Meyer. I watch her all the time. I stay up half the night watching Joyce Meyer. And I'm thinking, boy, don't you have any discernment at all? Okay? Now, I'm not saying Joyce Meyer's a terrible person, and if I sound like it, forgive me. I'm sorry, okay? She's, she may be fine, but her teaching's not, okay? But you can get false doctrine almost anywhere. In fact, it's hard to avoid it. Be loyal to the Word of God. Everybody that preaches to you, whether it's on radio or TV or from this pulpit or anywhere, they better prove it to you from the Bible. And if they don't prove it to you from the Bible, forget it. Okay? Now, every now and then a preacher will speculate on something, and if he identifies it as speculation, you know, I don't know this for sure, but I think, well, okay, fine. Um, but if he takes speculation, something from out in left field, and says, this is what God says, nonsense. Okay? Be loyal to God and His Word. And if, if a preacher can't back it up with Scripture, don't have anything to do with him. All right? That's what you've got to do. Make him give you chapter and verse. When I was in Bible college, that's, we said that all the time. Chapter and verse. Somebody would say something, be a discussion going in class. Chapter and verse. Show me that. If you can't show it to me, forget it. Um, Check the context of a verse. If they pull out something, you know, well, such and such. We're talking about Calvinism and several of their doctrines. Read the verse before and the verse after and you don't have a problem with it. Okay, they can't prove it. And interpret clear verses by unclear. No. Other way around. Interpret the unclear verses. If you know somebody shows you something and it says elect or predestinated or something like that, and you're struggling with it, and you're thinking, wow, I wonder what that means. Well, guess what? John 3.16 didn't change. Okay? John 6.47 didn't change. All those verses in the Bible that tell you you get to heaven by faith alone and it's available for whosoever. You know, they didn't change just because somebody came along hundreds of years later and came up with some screwy doctrine. Okay, stick to the Bible. That's what you need. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, and it could be that everybody here is saved, I don't know all of you. I can't get my wallet out because my, here. There's a chapstick. <laughs> Tell you what, this would be better. You can see it. Okay, here's my wristwatch. Let my right hand represent you and me. I taught Joe this, and no, I didn't. Um, this is you and me. This is our sin. Okay, I think we've got a room full of terrific people. But every one of you is a sinner in the sight of God. Okay, you may be better than me, but you don't have to be better than me to get to heaven. You have to be as good as God to get to heaven, and you're not. Okay, don't compare yourself with each other, compare yourself to God. And you do that, you find out that you're a sinner. Okay, now God loves us, but he hates our sin. To get to heaven, that sin has got to be gone, all gone. Well, I'll go to church. So will you be any better tomorrow because you were here today? Well, it'd be nice, but will you be perfect tomorrow? I'll get baptized. Well, that'll get you wet. You know, bring some ivory with you and it'll get you clean. But it won't wash away your sin. Okay, it's the blood of Christ that washes away sin, not water. God loves you. He wants you to go to heaven. You can't do it yourself. So let this hand represent Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He came to the earth, lived a perfect life, never, ever, ever sinned, never thought a bad thought, never did anything wrong. 
He went to the cross and he took your sin and my sin upon himself. He died. The wages of sin is death. That's why Jesus died. So he died and he paid for that sin. He was raised from the dead. And now if you will trust Christ, the Bible says you will be found in him. Not having your righteousness, but the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Okay? If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you need to understand that you cannot go to heaven on your own. You must have Christ. You can't help Him save you. All you can do is trust Him. Allow Him to save your soul. And He'll do that. <laughs>